Okay, welcome to this afternoon session, C, General Relativity and Alternative Theories. Our first speaker is going to be Felix Mirabel, and he's going to speak about the Bego Scientific Rencontre Lecture, Black Holes in the Universe. Please, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I am in Buenos Aires uh, uh, this moment, and there might be some... Uh, internet uh, fluctuation. Well, what I'm going to talk about is uh, recent research that I have been doing uh, in collaboration with uh, Philippe Laurent from uh, the French Atomic uh, Commission and uh, Luis Felipe Rodriguez from Mexico uh, uh, in UNAM in Morelia. And uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, is uh, black holes at cosmic dawn. And uh, here you see our understanding so far of the whole evolution of the universe, started starting from the Big Bang, the inflation period, and, uh, and then the starting of the uh, uh, recombination uh, between protons and electrons, and uh, initiating the dark uh, ages where the whole space was full with uh, neutral hydrogen and then some something like in between 100 and 200 million years uh, the first stars that are called uh, population three stars uh, were formed uh, the clusters of these stars and the first galaxies and uh, <coughs> And then uh, that was the onset because of the ultraviolet radiation from the first stars formed in the universe, the uh, reionization of the, of the uh, intergalactic medium, uh, which is called the era of uh, reionization that lasted uh, a little, uh, almost one billion years when the universe became uh, transparent again, because the intergalactic medium was almost complete, completely uh, reionized. And this is why we can observe back towards uh, the uh, earlier epochs of the universe and start identifying uh, part of the first galaxies that were formed and, uh, and uh, uh, the present understanding uh, from observations with Hubble uh, uh, in the <clears throat> rest frame UV radiation from the first stars that were formed <clears throat> is that uh, the reionization now is clear <clears throat> was uh, formed, uh, produced by small galaxies. Small galaxies were the uh, the ones that drove uh, the reionization. Now, with Hubble, uh, there has been uh, several projects to try to identify and to detect the first galaxies, but uh, they arrive up to a redshift of about eleven. This is the furthest away galaxy detected, uh, but they, uh, uh, this, uh, by the UV rest frame uh, observations uh, with Hubble and perhaps also with the G, uh, GMT uh, will not be possible uh, to detect the very first galaxies that were observed. And uh, <coughs> As you can see here, uh, uh, according to the observations with Hubble, here you see the, the star formation rate density as a function of redshift. Uh, there was a maximum uh, of uh, uh, star formation uh, rate density at redshifts in between two and three. Afterwards, the star formation rate started to uh, go down 
and going to the earlier epochs of the universe, also the star formation uh, rate uh, went down to very relatively uh, very low uh, values according to uh, the latest observations with, uh, with Hubble. So uh, since uh, we cannot uh, arrive uh, with Hubble to observe the first uh, galaxies and stars, uh, uh, there is the possibility, uh, is what I'm proposing, is that by the signals that left the uh, the remnants of those first stars, namely uh, black holes, perhaps we can uh, uh, get some information about the properties of the first stars and first galaxies formed in the universe. And, uh, and the advantage of this is that these uh, uh, sources, the fossils of uh, the first stars, Form, namely uh, black holes of uh, population three, they uh, produce radio emission. And, uh, and for the radio emission at uh, low, uh, relatively low wavelengths, the whole universe is transparent. And the idea is that perhaps we can uh, uh, arrive to have the signals coming from the, this epoch through uh, the radio emission of stellar mass black holes. The questions that uh, are of, uh, in the frontier, some of the questions of uh, in the frontier of uh, cosmology is how could we constrain uh, the first stars forming the universe and uh, what is the star formation rate density at very high redshifts, namely at redshifts greater than 15? Now, until 2011, the current understanding of the reionization epoch of the universe was. Uh, in according to a model called the Swiss cheese model, where <clears throat> you, uh, what, uh, after the formation of the, fir of the first stars uh, uh, at the dawn of the universe, these stars will produce UV radiation that will ionize uh, the, 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 the the intergalactic uh, gas producing uh, H2 bubbles that will expand at uh, speeds uh, of a few tens of kilometers per second. So uh, in the seventh microquasar workshop in Turkey, uh, in a conversation I had with uh, Rashid Sonaye, uh, he uh, proposed also, uh, he showed how uh, the uh, microquasars, namely jets, relativistic jets from uh, black holes in our galaxy uh, should uh, hit the interstellar gas. And uh, so uh, this idea uh, that Sunayesh uh, exposed there uh, rests in my mind. And uh, I presented in Maryland in 2011 <coughs> the idea that perhaps uh, stellar mass black holes uh, uh, in uh, uh, early epochs of the universe will have uh, uh, important impact in uh, our understanding of the era of uh, reionization. And uh, uh, I propose at, at that meeting uh, was uh, Avi Loeb, uh, <coughs> who was the director of <coughs> the theoretical group in Harvard of astrophysics. And at coffee, he uh, approached me uh, after my talk and uh, 
started to ask me about astrophysics, why uh, we should uh, 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 expect uh, heating. So he offered me to collaborate, and uh, so we published in 2011 a long paper that uh, where we proposed that the black holes in high mass X-ray binaries should be prolifically formed in the era of uh, reionization, an era of heating. And uh, the point is that uh, if uh, uh, black hole high mass X-ray binaries are formed promptly after the formation of the first uh, population three stars, they will produce hard X-rays that will propagate at the speed of light and will overcome uh, the formation uh, of uh, H2 bubbles and preheat the intergalactic medium before the era of reionization is finished. And, uh, and this uh, paper, then a couple of weeks after the publication of these papers, the, there was a new abuse in nature where it was proposed that if this idea was correct, that we propose here uh, about black hole high mass X-ray binaries, the uh, end of the reionization epoch should be smoother than previously thought, namely uh, uh, in the context of this Swiss cheese model. So the the sharp the the the, the, the reionization <coughs> will have proceed through a uh, formation of uh, ionized gas much less patchy that was uh, uh, proposed at the beginning. So what are black, black holes high mass X-ray binaries? Uh, <coughs> they are uh, binary systems composed uh, by a black hole that uh, accretes matter from a massive star through an accretion disk that produce uh, X-rays. And, uh, and uh, these X-rays, as, as I said, uh, if, uh, will, if they were produced, they are hard X-rays. If they were produced very early, they will preheat the intergalactic mean. Now I'm... Uh, proposing that the relativistic jets from these uh, uh, microquasars should also uh, uh, play an important role at the down of the universe if they were prolifically formed at that time. Now, what is the reason? What, what are the astrophysical new results that justify this hypothesis? And there were, I don't have the time to go through that. Uh, there are hundreds of papers now since uh, 2011, <clears throat> but uh, there are three main reasons. First, we know now from observations and models that uh, massive stars are formed in binary and multiple systems. We know that more than 90% of the massive stars that are formed in star forming regions in the Milky Way and in the large Magallanic clouds are uh, formed in, in groups that are gravitationally bound. And, uh, <clears throat> and there are also theoretical models now with large computers where it is clear now that population of three stars were not dominated by extremely stars or solar masses as believed before, but uh, because the, the protostars, before they are formed, the stars, they fragment uh, the maximum uh, uh, masses uh, of stars uh, of population three would have been of about 100, 110, and then there will be a very small fraction, 
less than 0.01% of some massive stars that will be formed because of uh, fusion between uh, two stars, but not of hundreds, several hundreds of uh, solar masses. The second reason is that uh, stars, we know that stars with uh, masses greater than 25 solar masses and very low metallicity, they end as black holes. And uh, by different uh, mechanisms, but they end as black holes. And uh, most of them at those metallicities end directly as black holes, namely without energetic supernovae. And uh, this is uh, from uh, <coughs> a multitude of, uh, of uh, theoretical and uh, uh, simulations uh, done uh, now. <clears throat> and the third reason is that uh, now in the, uh, 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 on the basis of the uh, southern uh, 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 Chandra deep field up to a redshift of 2.5, it is found that the luminosity of high mass X-ray binaries in the galaxies for a given star formation rate increase with redshift according to this equation. And uh, the interpretation is that this is due to the, <coughs> to the decrease in metallicity, namely to the, to the fact that the chemical complexity of the universe going up towards higher, higher uh, redshifts was being reduced progressively. Uh, so one of the questions, uh, if we cannot see directly the first uh, stars form of population three is uh, is what uh, has been proposed now since uh, two or three decades uh, is that there should be the imprint in the of, of the first stars and black holes or in the universe in the 21 in the reshifted 21 centimeter line of the atomic hydrogen and uh, this line is the hyperfine transition in the ground state of atomic hydrogen. And uh, as you know, uh, uh, there are several uh, very large interferometers for low frequencies being built, for instance, SKA, for which perhaps the main scientific drive is to find the uh, signals stars of the first stars and black holes that were formed in the universe. <clears throat> so in the, and there are two types of uh, interferometers and also single dipoles, which measure the global signature of, uh, of stars and black holes. And uh, in 2011 here, you see uh, the prediction uh, that uh, was uh, published in our paper and was uh, computed by uh, uh, Pritchard in this collaboration. You see here the prediction of the most prominent signal that should uh, be observed from stars and black holes in the highly redshifted 21 centimeter line uh, up to uh, uh, um, frequencies of in between uh, 60, 60 and 80 for different values. And you can see here that in this prediction of this, uh, uh, um, uh, that uh, is uh, this different colors corresponds to different values of a parameter uh, that uh, depends on many uh, factors, but essentially on the density of the atomic hydrogen and the production of X-rays. For instance, for this one, or for the blue, the blocking of X-rays uh, should be very large because the densities of the 
uh, of the uh, atomic hydrogen or uh, molecular gas <coughs> should be uh, five times 10 to the 23 centimeter per square uh, 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 centimeter, at least that, and the temperatures of the order of 10 uh, degrees K only. So uh, the surprise that uh, produced a great excitement uh, among people working uh, in uh, cosmology was the tentative detection reported in nature uh, by uh, an experiment called EDGES of a very uh, deep absorption uh, uh, produced in between the redshifts of 20 and 18, which correspond to an interval of time of only 20 million years, a uh, very uh, sharp uh, absorption uh, produced, uh, initiated uh, at uh, onset at uh, redshift of 20 as uh, was roughly predicted here in, in these models. And this produced a big uh, excitement. And, uh, and there are two things. Uh, first, the reported uh, uh, tentative detection by edges, uh, the absorption uh, was about two to three times the absorption predicted by the strongest uh, signal here against the cosmic microwave background. So it was, that was a, a surprise. Uh, and second, the shape of the absorption here is bottom flat, whereas here is, uh, has a Gaussian shape. So immediately, uh, uh, it was actually in the same issue of nature, probably uh, the uh, referee of, of uh, the edges uh, uh, article. Uh, it was claimed that this implied a new physics and uh, this uh, excess of absorption uh, uh, was due uh, to uh, cooling of the uh, uh, spin temperature of uh, atomic hydrogen due to interaction of dark matter with uh, baryons at that epoch. Well, this is, there were many, many articles uh, claiming new physics, but uh, the simple astrophysical interpretation is that there could be a cosmic radio background in addition to the cosmic microwave background that will enhance, boost the absorption by a factor of two or three. Uh, of course, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, tentative detection by edges uh, needs confirmation. And uh, I will say that uh, and there have been many uh, questions about this. Uh, it has been uh, the, uh, proposed that uh, there are many caveats to believe that this is true. Well, that might be the case. Uh, I cannot judge that. Uh, uh, but uh, in the context of the hypothesis that uh, we propose, uh, there should be a cosmic uh, radio background due to uh, the fossils of uh, the first stars formed in the universe, namely from uh, this accreting stellar mass as black holes. And one can ask whether there is any hint about a cosmic uh, uh, radio background and uh, uh, the first uh, hint was obtained by a, a balloon experiment uh, carried out uh, uh, by, uh, that was a NASA experiment called uh, ARCHI-2 uh, in the year 2011. Where, uh, here you see, uh, to illustrate what they found, uh, here you see the temperature 
brightness temperature of the radio emission of the sky as a function of frequency. And in red, you see here the cosmic microwave background, which is constant, well, it's, as you know, is thermal emission. But then observing at uh, longer wavelengths, namely low, uh, sorry, a lar a larger wavelengths, shorter frequencies uh, than one gigahertz, they uh, found a, a synchrotron uh, emission that climbs going to uh, 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 longer wavelengths. And, uh, and uh, of course, uh, the, there should be a, a very prominent uh, component due to cosmic rays in the halo, halo of our galaxy that produce synchrotron emission. But uh, several uh, teams of radio astronomers have tried to identify uh, individual sources associated to this. Uh, for instance, a large group at uh, NRO led by Condon, uh, and also uh, analyzing the possible uh, em emission from dust in this, uh, uh, and uh, that was not found. So there is the there is the suggestion that there should be uh, some cosmic smooth synchrotron emission. Uh, that uh, has not uh, been identified. This, uh, this uh, uh, observations by Archive 2 in 2011 were confirmed in 2019 uh, by a ground, uh, a ground uh, based uh, interferometer. So we know uh, uh, Stellar mass black holes in uh, binary systems, uh, in X-ray binary systems, uh, might be powerful sources of, uh, of radio emission. And you have uh, from them steady jets, transient jets. But in all cases, there are compact jets that are produced very close to uh, the black hole and that have uh, uh, lengths of uh, tens or hundreds, a few hundreds of astronomical units, and they are oriented in the same direction as the large-scale uh, jets. And, uh, and these uh, uh, compact jets uh, uh, have been studied, and now we know uh, they uh, have, uh, should have uh, magnetic fields of at least uh, of at least uh, uh, 100 gauss. And uh, Cygnus X1 is uh, also this compact jet uh, found in Cygnus X1. You can see here Cygnus X1. Uh, the, this is a blow up of the Subar second jets in uh, the compact jet in Cygnus X1. And if you follow the direction of that jet, you see at five parsecs away, a bow shock being produced. And, uh, and the uh, 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 observations by uh, uh, Philippe Laurent, who is a co-author of uh, this investigation, uh, with the satellite integral, they found uh, in Cygnus X1, uh, that uh, this is the spectrum at uh, uh, have very hard uh, X-rays and soft uh, gamma rays made by integral, both uh, by the imager and the spectrometer. And you see here a compromise uh, component, but beyond 0.4 megahertz, they found a power law component up to two megahertz. That is the, 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 the limit of uh, detection uh, uh, of uh, integral uh, for, for this. And, uh, and the point is that this, uh, uh, this uh, component is polarized 
at more than 70%. And the interpretation is that this, uh, uh, this component, this very high energy component is coming from the compact jet in Cygnus 61. And uh, this will imply uh, magnetic fields larger of at least 10 to the 4 Gauss. Uh, now, these jets, uh, uh, the synchrotron cooling of uh, these jets uh, uh, dominates uh, at, or the, the inverse Compton cooling of the uh, cosmic microwave background, uh, even at the redshift of 10, 20. So, uh, once uh, these jets are produced, the radio emission produced by uh, these jets will go away and will not be stopped, and the whole universe will be transparent to this uh, radio emission. And the point is that although that the uh, energy loss uh, due to uh, synchrotron cooling is compensated by a continuous injection of freshly accelerated electrons that keep these jets being quasi steady by uh, uh, orders of time of uh, tens of thousands uh, uh, up to 100,000 uh, years. So- Five minutes left. Okay. Well, uh, we have uh, developed the question of uh, uh, how many, we have asked uh, how many uh, uh, microquasars should be needed to account for this excess absorption of edges. And uh, we found out uh, using uh, what we know about microquasars in our galaxy that will be needed two times 10 to the 14 microquasars being formed uh, at cosmic down during an uh, interval of time of 30 million years. And uh, interesting thing that uh, while I was working on, on that uh, paper and I was finishing these calculations appeared a paper by Langer and 40 astrophysicists that uh, work on uh, massive stellar binary formation uh, uh, and uh, binary black holes. And the uh, interesting thing is that uh, they uh, propose that high mass X-ray binaries are, as I had proposed, uh, a transition phase in one of the models uh, uh, for uh, the way in which binary black holes uh, detected by LIGO and Virgo are formed. And uh, so using the relations in, in numbers, uh, I found uh, that uh, uh, the star formation rate density at cosmic down should be given by this equation. And, uh, and uh, the IMF, uh, of course, is not known, but if we assume, according to the current models, that, uh, well, should be, most of the stars should be in between 25 and 100 uh, solar masses, one arrives to this star formation rate density. And uh, the value that we get comparing with what uh, the UV people using uh, Hubble find is that uh, uh, this is, I repeat, this is the star formation rate as a function of redshift up to 10. And then if you go to the interval between 20 uh, and 18 of redshift, you get here. And this is uh, the errors that we can determine in our uh, calculation. And we found that the star formation rate density should be at a, a much higher level than the one derived from the UV press frame 
observations. So what are the possibility, the possible interpretation of this is that first, that edges is wrong. Uh, however, there must be a cosmic uh, radio background according to what we know from astrophysics. And perhaps it is not that strong as uh, we have uh, calculated. Uh, perhaps the amplitude is not as large as the one uh, 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 determined by edges. So, but if that is true, then, uh, 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 and if it is confirmed and implies a, a cosmic radio background uh, of uh, this brightness temperature, and uh, assuming that the escape fraction of UV photons from the very early galaxies, small galaxies form was less than 5%, this uh, conclusion might be biased by uh, the fact that the UVs cannot uh, uh, read to, to us uh, because of this uh, very large uh, absorption by the same atomic hydrogen at that time. So the conclusions is, uh, there are many conclusions, uh, but the most important is that the imprint of black hole high mass X-ray binary microquasar in the redshifted 21 centimeter line of uh, atomic hydrogen uh, is the smoking gun of population three stars and nowadays might be uh, the principal way to get uh, some knowledge about uh, cosmic cosmic doubt. I think I should uh, leave here because uh, I have just uh, five minutes. So thank you very much. We thank the speaker and we have three minutes for a rapid question if someone wants to, to do it. Okay. Mm. No questions. So let's thank the speaker again and we can go with the next speaker. Thank you. Okay, the next speaker is Marika Asgari and she's gonna talk about weak gravitational lensing and the kilo degree survey. Yeah, uh, thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes, we do. Okay, uh, just wait a second. Okay, it's loaded now. Um, yeah, so uh, hello everyone. I first of all wanted to thank the uh, organizers for inviting me to give this talk. Today I will talk to you about cosmology results oh. with the Q Sorry. Sorry. Um, and also known as KITS. Uh, the data, latest data that we use for this analysis covers a thousand square degrees in the sky, uh, shown in these two stripes. Um, and um, here you can see the mass map inferred from a weak lensing signal. So this is like a two-dimensional matter distribution. Um, and uh, what we did with this data was to use the gravitational lensing and combine it, and also combine it with spectroscopic surveys to set constraints on cosmological parameters, assuming flat on the CDM. So um, I just uh, should note that this picture here is um, Partly the actual data, partly artist impressions. So the background is mainly put for aesthetic reasons, and these two stripes are not actually where they're shown to be in the sky. They definitely don't go through the Milky Way. <clears throat> okay, so when you think about um, uh, cosmology with kids, 
the main probe is uh, weak gravitational lensing by the large scale structures. And here uh, you can see how it works. So you have galaxies in the background and their light passes by large scale structures and it's distorted due to the gravitational field of these structures. And then when we observe its shape, it's, um, it's changed. Now, if you have a, a couple of galaxies in the background and their light passes by similar structures, the distortions are going to be coherent, creating a correlation between the shapes. And this correlation is what we measure as our primary signal called the cosmic shear signal. Now, what I showed you was the uh, theory behind the cosmic shear signal, but in practice, there's much more to it. So first of all, the signal we get from a pair of galaxies is very, very, very small. So we can only hope to measure something um, with uh, if we combine millions and millions of observations of galaxies. So for that, we need high resolution and deep images. Then we can go and separate the objects in the images into an object catalog. At the same time, we make observations in multiple photometric bands to get the colors of these objects. And then using the colors, we can divide the objects into galaxies and stars. This is important for two reasons. One is that, uh, <clears throat> one is that uh, galaxies are what we use as our primary probe, so the shapes, um, and we don't want them to be contaminated with stars. And secondly, uh, we can use the stars to correctly measure the shape of galaxies. Um, and that is because uh, aside from lensing that distorts the shapes of galaxies, there are other effects like um, atmospheric effects or the distortions due to the telescope that change the shape of galaxies. Uh, so we need to correct for these, and we can use the stars, since they're supposed to be point sources, and um, to uh, basically model these extra distortions and correct for them. And at the same time, we can use the colors of galaxies to have an estimate of the redshift. And this one's important because if a galaxy is further, further away from us, so at a higher redshift, then its light will pass by more structures and therefore we expect it to be lensed more, so have a higher signal. So we need to know that too. But these shapes that we measure are not perfect due to noise in the data or blending of um, images and galaxies. And um, to calibrate our measurements, we use uh, realistic image simulations that have all the effects in the actual images and then use that to calibrate our measurements. And the redshifts as well are not perfect because we only have photometric redshifts. Um, so uh, we have a few uh, photometric bands to measure them uh, instead of having spectros spectroscopy for the galaxies. Uh, but for a smaller population of them, we have overlapping spectroscopic surveys and we can use that to calibrate our measurements for the distribution of the redshifts. Uh, we can't calibrate every single galaxy, but we don't care about every single galaxy because this is a statistical analysis. So once we have these two main ingredients, we can um, measure our cosmic shear signal. So we usually divide the catalog into tomographic redshift bins to increase the uh, amount of information we can get from the data. Um, and then, then, we uh, then we measure the um, signal that is a two-point statistic. And you can use different two-point statistics. Um, the one that is usually used is uh, called shear two-point correlation function. So it correlates the shapes of galaxies. Uh, so now we have our measurement. We need to be able to predict uh, the theoretical value or of the signal. And for that, we can use analytical models like the HALO model. And we use the same uh, method to calculate the covariance of the data. Or we can use simulations like embodied simulations. Um, and for both of these, uh, we need the input from uh, here. So we need to know what is the redshift distribution of galaxies to be able to predict the signal. 
And then once we have uh, all these ingredients, we can get our likelihood. But before we can um, set constraints on our cosmology, we have to take into account nuisance effects. So nuisance effects can be divided into two groups. Um, first group is astrophysical effects uh, that can either affect the shape of galaxies, like intrinsic alignments of galaxies, or can affect um, matter distribution, like baryonic feedback that uh, changes the matter distribution on small physical scales. So we need to take these into account. And then finally, we can get our cosmology out of this. So set uh, constraints on parameters of a model or compare, compare different models with each other. So it all looks very straightforward, um, but wait, there is another effect that um, you need to take into account. And that is the subconscious biases that the humans bring into this equation. So in order to stop ourselves from uh, playing around with these uh, different options in the pipeline to get the cosmology or the end result that we want, we obscured the data. Uh, and until the very, very last moment, we didn't know what is the truth. So we finished our analysis and then um, then it then asked uh, someone to um, tell us which one was the correct data. And we take this very seriously in kids. So now that I showed you the overall view of how a cosmic shear pipeline looks like, let me tell you a little bit about the model. So the model that we used was standard cosmological model. Currently, that's flattened on the CDM. And uh, this model, um, we like it. Why? Because it's simple. A handful of parameters can capture its essence. And also, at the same time, it's been very successful in explaining various observations from uh, cosmic microwave background to geometric probes like supernovae type 1a and uh, probes of large scale structure and so on. So now you might ask, uh, why do we continue doing cosmology if the simple model can explain everything? And that's a good question, but the answer is twofold. Uh, one reason is that <clears throat> We want to know the exact value of these parameters, or we want to know these parameters to better accuracy. And also, although this model is very simple, it's not very physical because two of its main components are dark, that's dark matter and dark energy. And I think this is where my talk kind of fits into this session uh, being about alternative models, basically. Although we didn't look at any alternative models, uh, not yet at least. Um, so we started doing precision cosmology to set um, tighter constraints uh, on parameters and started seeing some cracks in this perfect simple model. Uh, the largest discordance right now is between the Hubble uh, parameter measurements from the distance ladder and the Planck measurements of CMB. Uh, and if it was just these two, uh, which are, which are um, actually Coincidentally, the uh, furthest away in terms of cosmic era from each other, <clears throat> then we would have said, okay, maybe one or both of them had a systematic in the data or the analysis, and that would explain things away. But there are more and more surveys and analysis, uh, uh, observations that are finding differences, uh, although they're not as significant yet. So this is uh, kind of hinting to uh, some missing piece in standard model, but it's not yet um, set. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about the data. So KITS is a weak gravitational lensing specific survey, meaning that the uh, images and the quality of data is very high. So uh, it is... Um, uh, the shape measurement is more reliable. And you can see a picture of the telescope here. This is on Paranal in Chile. We've analyzed 1,000 square degrees of the data with 21 million galaxies. And the observations for the full survey have been completed. That's 1,350 square degrees, but it hasn't been analyzed yet. This extra bit of the data. One thing that makes kids very special is that in combination with its sister survey, Viking, 
um, we, can, we have observations of galaxies in nine photometric bands, which is uh, generally larger than most other um, similar surveys. And this allows us to have a better estimate of the redshift of galaxies with fewer outliers. Okay, so um, the recent analysis that we did are uh, explained in these five papers uh, that came out in July. The first two papers uh, describe the cosmological analysis. The first one is cosmic shear only, and the second one is a combined probe uh, analysis. And then the next three describe the methodology used in the first two and the catalog making and the calibrations described in the photometric redshifts and shear measurements papers. Also, because I don't have very much time to go into any details, uh, I put a link here. Once you have the slides, you can go to the link to other talks uh, about kids uh, that are shared in the Kids Consortium YouTube page. Okay, so let's jump into the results. <clears throat> so this is the cosmic shear only results shown uh, in sigma eight and omega m on the left hand side. Uh, so this elongated, these elongated contours are our results. We use three sets of two point statistics to do the analysis, um, ranging from real space two point correlation functions to Fourier space band powers, and there is a third one called Kusebis, which I won't go into the details of. But the reason we did it with three sets of statistics is because these statistics are all um, sensitive to different uh, physical scales, and each of them have uh, their own characteristics that make them useful to compare with each other. Uh, so uh, this um, elongated, these elongated contours are usually known as the cosmic banana. And the reason for this degeneracy is that um, with uh, weak lensing alone, we cannot tell between a case, a universe which has a lot of matter, so high omega m, but this matter is not very clustered with each other, uh, so low sigma eight, um, versus one that is the opposite, so it's a little bit of matter, but it's highly clustered. So you get this degeneracy. And that's why we usually look at this other parameter called S8, that's shown on the right. And this S8 is a combination of sigma eight and omega m that is um, pretty much perpendicular to the cosmic banana. Uh, so we have our three contours, and then on top of that, you can see the Planck results in red. What you see here is there isn't that much overlap between our contours and the Planck contours. Now you can look at the same uh, Analysis in a different way because we set most of our constraints on S8 or rather this other parameter, capital sigma eight. Uh, we're just looking at this parameter now. <clears throat> so sigma eight is basically like S8 with a different power. And this power is set such that the contours, um, the, uh, the capital sigma eight is exactly perpendicular to the banana. So, for example, here you can see that the pink contour is slightly tilted, and that is because this power of 0.5 doesn't really um, describe the degeneracy direction for the pink contour here. Okay, so you can see the alpha values in the bottom here, and each of the panels is following one of the statistics. On the first row, you can see the results from Planck, and then the next three are the results from Kids 1000. Um, and uh, from the three different statistics. So what you see here is that the error bars are completely separate from each other, which means that uh, there is tension between the results, and this tension is uh, somewhere around 3 to 3.5 sigma. Um, <clears throat> And also you see that the uh, constraining power from kids on this parameter is uh, of similar level to Planck. Okay, so we wanted to see if our analysis is robust against systematics. And uh, we reanalyzed the data by making some changes that are within reason in uh, our uh, nuisance parameters. 
So from 5 to 12, we are looking at the impact of um, observational systematics, for example, um, uncertainties in calibration of the shapes or the redshift. And then number 13 and 14, we're looking at the impact of astrophysical uh, systematics. So the number 13 is uh, when we assume that there is no variant feedback. And number 14, we're looking at a different model for intrinsic elements of galaxies. And what you see here is that the shifts in the value of uh, capital sigma eight uh, is quite small in, most ca in all cases, and all the shifts are within what we expect. So there are no surprises here. And then we wanted to see if, um, uh, if our data is self-consistent within the different tomographic bins. So we removed each of the bins and reanalyzed the data. Uh, so the bin one is the lowest redshift bin, so it has the lowest signal, and bin five is the highest redshift bin with the highest signal. And what you see here is that um, if we remove bin one, two, or three, uh, the impact on the analysis is very, very small. But if you remove four and five, we get a much larger shift in the results. And this shouldn't be a surprise because, um, as I said, the lower bins have lower signal, while the two highest bins have most of the signal. So if we remove the lower bins, nothing really happens. While if you remove one of the two highest bins, it's kind of like removing half of the data. Uh, half of the useful data from your analysis, and that's why you see these shifts. Nevertheless, we went and did a full Bayesian analysis and uh, to see the consistency between these different bins and found that bin four and five are fully consistent. Um, but interestingly, that test uh, showed that bin two is an outlier. But as you see here, removing bin two has no impact on the analysis. So we kept it in the fiducial analysis. All right, and finally here, uh, we can compare um, our results with previous cosmic shear analysis results uh, shown in green. So number four is showing our uh, the kits results from its uh, previous data release. So that was 450 square degrees, so kits 450. And then number six and seven are showing results from um, uh, other cosmic shear surveys, that's the dark energy survey and our hyper supreme cap. Um, and, and number five is a joint analysis of KIT uh, 450 and the dark energy year one. So, what you see here is that our data, our analysis are consistent within themselves, but they're also consistent with other cosmic shear analysis. And most interestingly, uh, the value that Planck predicts for S8 is um, always higher than all of these data points. So they don't scatter around it. Okay, so I showed you cosmic shear results so far. Um, and with cosmic shear, we're correlating shapes of galaxies, but we could also correlate positions of galaxies. And this is... Um, uh, much easier if you have spectroscopic surveys because then you can find the positions, the 3D position of galaxies much better. Uh, so <clears throat> galaxies being traces of matter, when you um, correlate the positions of two galaxies, you're basically finding out about the uh, local matter distribution around them. Um, and then you can cross-correlate these two to get a third probe uh, called galaxy galaxy lensing. And that's when you correlate the shape of a background galaxy with the position of a foreground galaxy. Okay, so let's see what happens if we do that. Five minutes uh, left. So, okay. Uh, so this plot is showing S8 again. Um, in uh, pink, you have cosmic shear. And um, if you add galaxy galaxy lensing to it, you get the purple one, which is doesn't really add very much. Um, and then we have the galaxy clustering contour that's pretty much perpendicular to our contours. And this is from BOSDR12, Sanchez et al, uh, full shape analysis. 
And then if once you combine all of them together, you get the red contours here. Um, so again, you see that it doesn't, it doesn't really change our conclusions about S8 being lower than uh, what Planck finds, but it um, breaks the degeneracy between S8 and omega M a bit more. And also it tells us that uh, it's not omega M that is the culprit here. Uh, so the tension we find in S8 uh, between Planck and our results is about three sigma with the combined probe analysis. <clears throat> and finally, we can look at uh, other analysis uh, with similar, um, similar setup. So in orange, we have the dark energy saver, survey results, and in blue is the uh, previous combination of boss and kids. So that's kids for 50. I see that our red contours are consistent with these two, uh, but the uh, values you find are not consistent with Planck. Um, and here you can see that uh, the tension between these two is driven by sigma eight, not omega m. Um, and that S8 is 8.3% lower than what Planck uh, predicts from the CMB anisotropy measurements. All right, so I will summarize here. So we see a three sigma tension in S8, that is assuming a flat lambda CDM model. Um, and from our combined probe analysis, so this is called three times two PT because there are three two point correlations that we use. Uh, we see that the tension is driven by sigma eight, which means that the universe is less clumpy than Planck predicts. And these results are validated using mock kits and BOSS galaxy surveys, uh, kits image simulations and null tests, spectroscopic photometric clustering analysis, and all identify systematic uncertainties folded through as nuisance practice. And finally, I want to say that we're very much looking forward to the new results from DES and HSC, which should come out soon. Um, and I will end on this slide showing uh, that this is the KITS team. Uh, this was a team effort. Um, uh, and you can see this is pre-lockdown photos, and then there is the in-lockdown that we kept on uh, going using Zoom. And there's a list of our funders here as well. Thank you. We thank the speaker. Uh, it's question time now. We have Gregory Vereshagi who would like to pose you a question. So but please, Gregory, would you use your microphone? Okay, Marika. Just curious, you are comparing your results with the Planck satellite uh, data, which are measurements at very high redshift. What about low redshift measurements of cosmological parameters? I mean, you know, the Deutsch effect and so, so on, this type of measurements. Do they agree? Uh, so we haven't compared with every measurement, but um, it depends if they set constraints on the same parameters as we do. Uh, so um, one of the reasons we're comparing with Planck uh, and we're not actually including CMB lensing is to see if there is something missing in the lambda CDM model, basically. That's happened maybe in between the two that we're not taking into account. I don't think, I don't know of any observations that are uh, inconsistent with our results, given that our main constraints are on S8. I, I don't know if you, you. have. Yes, yes, thank you. Can you show um, the plant result in your figure? Is the, with the, is this one? So is this, this is Planck. Yes, 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 exactly. Thanks. Thanks. Yes. Therefore, the, it's quite interesting that you find results which are uh, in some tension with them. Yes, it's, it's in tension. It's like at, at the level that becomes interesting, but it's not decisive yet, I guess. Well, thank you very much. Very good. Thank you. 
We have time for other questions, please. Okay, so if there are no other questions, uh, let's thank the speaker again and go on with the next speaker. Sorry, it was gonna be uh, Daniel Blixt and he's gonna talk about viability of teleparallel gravity. Thank you. Okay. Do you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, great. Um, so I want to give an introduction to teleparallel gravity and also comment on the viability of uh, teleparallel gravity theories. And firstly, uh, what not all people know about is that there are uh, several theories which are physically completely equivalent to general relativity, at least classically. So we have a teleparallel equivalent to general relativity and symmetric teleparallel equivalent to general relativity. And they are different, so to say, geometrical frameworks for describing general relativity. And they only differ by a boundary term, which does not contribute to the field equations. Um, and since I will focus on teleparallel gravity, uh, it is important to know about the concept of torsion. And to describe torsion, we cannot only uh, uh, deal with a metric, but we have to introduce something uh, called tetrads, which are uh, kind of like a square root of the metric. And then the torsion components can be uh, defined in the following way. Um, using the Weissenberg covariant derivative of a tetrad, basically anti-symmetric part of this, and explicitly these are derivative of tetrads and uh, some contraction with something called the spin connection, uh, which are defined in uh, the last equation with uh, derivatives of uh, Lorentz matrices. And to show how, uh, how it comes about that this framework is equivalent to general relativity, um, we um, in, uh, look at how does a general cur curvature look like. Uh, so curvature in general can also include uh, torsion. And uh, I have this notion of circle, this is when we have a Levi-Civita connection, that is a uh, standard formulation of general relativity. But the uh, full Ricci scalar, including torsion, um, can be de decomposed into the normal Ricci scalar used in general relativity, plus a torsion scalar uh, minus a boundary term. And uh, in teleparallel gravity, we demand curvature to be zero. That is not the Levi-Civita one, but the total one. And uh, from this equation, we can write um, that Levi-Civita Ricci scalar is proportional to a torsion scalar plus a boundary term, which does not contribute to the field equation. Uh, so we are now in a ge geometry where we demand zero curvature, but non-vanishing torsion. And we get the same physics as general relativity. So now we consider modified uh, teleparallel gravity theories. So uh, of course, uh, now when we know that there are equivalent theories of general relativity and we look at uh, modified gravity, then the question arises which theory to modify. So if we explore um, modifying 
from the starting point of telepel gravity, uh, then one can try to do something like f of t, which is similar to f of r. And note that these theories are not the same um, because they differ by a bounder term. So, uh, and when you take a function uh, of a bounder term, uh, then it will contribute to the field equation. So we will get physically different theories from f of r by looking at f of t theories. And another uh, theory one can write uh, can easily be seen if we write out this uh, torsion scalar explicitly. Uh, we see that in this equivalent to general relativity, we have some uh, seemingly arbitrary coefficients just uh, coming here. So if we relax this and uh, let these coefficients be arbitrary and consider basically equivalent to general relativity to be a subcase of this, then we can introduce some new theories of uh, general relativity. And this has historically been named new general relativity. So that was basically the introduction to uh, teleparallel gravity. Uh, now we need to think about the viability. Uh, so these are certainly interesting theories because we, they are different uh, from those we, you can find in Riemannian geometries. Uh, but one should be cautious because they can suffer from pathologies. And if there is, for instance, a discontinuity in the number of degrees of freedom uh, between perturbation around some background and uh, its higher order theory, then the theory suffers from something which is known as strong coupling. And if uh, we have a strongly coupled field in our theory, then we cannot tr trust our perturbation uh, for fear around those background, which of course leads to uh, not be able to uh, give predictions around these backgrounds uh, or important predictions. And so what is the status of teleparallel gravity theories? So we know that uh, f of t theories are ghost free and new general relativity has a one parameter class of theories which is ghost free uh, the other uh, parameters have some ghost instabilities and um, f of t uh, seems to suffer from strong coupling and this has been tested around uh, general flrw backgrounds and for new general relativity, it also seems to suffer from uh, strong coupling, but it has only been investigated around Minkowski backgrounds. Um, so we don't know about general FLRW backgrounds uh, yet. Uh, so, two minutes left. Ah, thank you. Uh, so to solve um, what to do in the future, uh, we would like to solve the dis um, uh, ah, okay, skip this one. Uh, we uh, should check whether new general relativity is strongly coupled around more uh, general FLRW backgrounds. And uh, we can also explore uh, if there's any other teleparal, uh, there are some other candidates for teleparal gravity uh, beyond those I mentioned. And one can check if uh, these new other theories uh, avoid um, pathologies such as strong coupling. And one can also uh, look at the quantum aspects of teleparal equivalent to general relativity um, to see if this gives any uh, desired feature. So my advice to you is to, if you are interested in Teleparallel gravity, be cautious because some uh, theories uh, have pathologies. But listen to the next talk by Sebastian to have some more positive um, um, uh, uh, direction of teleparallel gravity. Thank you for uh, your attention.
We thank the speaker. We have one question by Kirill Maltsev. Please, Kirill. Yes, uh, thanks for the uh, for the talk. Um, I just read it out. So, is there any physical interpretation of the B tensor that you introduced um, to uh, to account for the Ricci scalar together with the uh, torsion uh, tensor in the telepolygon gravity framework? So, does this B tensor, um, as it doesn't enter the Einstein field equations, uh, does it have any physical interpretation or? Is it more considered as a mathematical artifact of the theory? Yeah, so classically, it doesn't matter at all which boundary term you use. Um, for example, if you do Hamiltonian analysis of general relativity, you add this your Gibbons Hawking term to, uh, and it's similar to this one. And uh, people look at these boundary terms uh, when they look at for example uh, uh, mass uh, around black uh, adm mass and uh, uh, things like energy momentum tensor so uh, these are basically the interpretations but i am not an expert in in this uh, specific uh, Theory. Language of gravity being the curvature of space time. So never, um, Rapidly, please. Yeah, 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 I, I understand. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's hard to say, um, in my opinion. Uh, it's um i think the curvature of space time in a sense um makes sense um but still um how exactly how you describe it geometrically um In the end, you uh, you can rewrite when it's equivalent to general relativity. You can rewrite everything with a Levitch-Vita connection. But if you look at modified gravity, um, of course, your um, curvature will not be the uh, if if one of these uh, theories would be true, then uh, this language would. Uh, not be the best way to describe it. Okay, let's thank the speaker again, and we go on with the program. So the next speaker is gonna be Sebastian Bahamond. He's gonna talk about solar system tests in modified teleparallel gravity. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. And also, can you see the slides? Yes, yeah, slides are going are fine. Okay. Okay, perfect. So, okay, thank you for giving the opportunity to talk today. Hopefully, we'll have time to explain everything. So this is a work that it was uh, is going to be published in JCAP, so it will appear, I think, two more weeks. It's related to solar system tests in modified telepathic theories of gravity. Then I will just briefly introduce what is telepathic gravity, because already Daniel did it. Then I will talk about some perturbed solutions that we found in a specific model. And then I will briefly talk about some phenomenology about these solutions. So as, Manu, as uh, Daniel said, but the teleparallel equation of GR has this action. I mean, he didn't actually say it, but this is the action for the teleparallel equation of GR, where this T is just a combination of torsion. So, and the important thing is that since this quantity T differs by a boundary with respect to the Levi-Civita Ricci scalar, one, uh, if one uh, derives the first, the first equation of this theory, one gets that, that you get exactly the same prediction, the same uh, equation as general relativity. 
So that's why it's called the telephone equivalent of the of the. Uh, so actually, they, they are this very important point. Like classically, it's not possible. There is this equivalency between these two frameworks, the SAP, GR, and GR. So it's not possible to make any observation to distinguish between them. Uh, so all the classical experiment that we know in GR, all the uh, photon, uh, black holes, everything, also can be understood as a confirmation of the parameter of GR because if you have exactly the same equation, the same geodesic equation, everything is exactly the same. So uh, following to the question before, you can also say that torsion is, is uh, the, the field which is given the, 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 the gravity and not curvature, okay? But the problem is what happens when we modify teleparallel given of GR? We, we can modify GR. So the question is what happens that uh, when you start with the EGR and you try to modify this theory? And then when you start modifying this theory, as Daniel pointed out, you could obtain different things as a modification of GR. And this is one road that has been explored for some time. And an analogy, as uh, Daniel said, you have the so called F of T gravity, which was very popular sometimes because it explains some problem in cosmology and also is a second order theory. And it's a very nice theory in this regard, but it has all these pathologic, pathological problems that uh, my, uh, Daniel said about the strong recapping problem. But we know that when we have this action instead, instead of T, we put F of T, we automatically know that the equivalency between F of R and F of T is not the, is not the equivalent. Because now we are considering a function of, a, of, a, of this scalar, and that's a linear combination. So this means that now this boundary term actually affects the, the theory and the field separation. But you don't get the, the nice result that you have the same theory as GR, let's say. So you can have different results as a, as a modification of GR. So one theory that, that will be interesting to analyze, and actually we don't know actually it will, it will suffer from pathology or not, like strong capital problems or others, is the, the so-called F of TV gravity. But instead of considering T in the action, you consider also the boundary term B, with this boundary term is the one related with the rich scalar, and is the one uh, which actually connects these two framework, let's say, connects the GR framework and the TEGR framework. So this theory is interesting because you can have automatically F of R, but in the teleparallel uh, equivalent of GR framework, so you can have exactly the same equation as F of R, but describing this as torsion, let's say, with the, with the boundary term, also, you can have this F of T gravity, but also you can have other fields like this uh, only considering this boundary term. So uh, this has been proposed some time ago, and it has started to be a little bit um, like a new avenue for the parallel fields of gravity. So what can we do with this theory? We can start with, for example, testing a spherical symmetry and try to do some phenomenology. So if we start with the with the, our metric, we have a, to reproduce the metric with the tetra, and we have many possible choices, and this I don't have the time to explain, but this is a good choice for the tetrad and spin connection uh, pair, which gives us uh, the correct symmetries of our field of uh, spherical symmetry, and also is compatible with the with the uh, with the fact that we can set or not the spin connection to vanish or not. In this case, we set the spin connection to vanish, and if you do this, you need to consider some specific choices of the tetrad, and this is this thing that I am showing here. And this data also gives you the correct result, let's say, from the Minkowski point of view, that you have that these two scalars, P and B, are identically zero as it is uh, the rich scalar. So, uh, of course, it's difficult to find exact solutions in modular gravity. Also, happens in F of, F of R. Also, in F of T, the gravity will be the same. It's hard to get a exact solution. So, one interesting technique that one can use is to uh, use some perturbed techniques. So, you have, for example, you said, okay, you have first cell as your background, and then you want on top of this a small perturbation on your metric coefficients. And then you expand all your first equation up to first order in this perturbation, and then you try to find uh, some solutions to this to your model up to first order in the perturbations. So that's what, exactly what we are going to do here. Uh, to do this, we start with this generical model when you have T, which is just GR, or T E GR, you have uh, the torture solution, because we know that T E GR is the same as GR, so you have the torture solution as in the background, plus this extra uh, model, which depends on the on combination of T and B or power law combinations. And then you can recover different power laws uh, 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 theories with this. And the idea is that if you do this, you incorporate this in your first equation, you expand up to first order, you will get some uh, 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 solutions. They are not exact, of course, but they are per solutions which is fine in this regard because we always think that you have GR as a background plus as a correction. 
So in this point of view, you need to think about that you have GR as the background, as the, the theory, plus a small projection which is related to the modification of EEGR in this point of view. And you get these nice solutions here. Uh, you can uh, see la later in, in the paper, you can see all the details, but you can find this solution. This is like a, an extension of Schwarzschild solutions uh, in the perturbation. And this depends, of course, on the parameters that we have in our field, which is alpha, beta, and gamma. Okay? So this is more the idea. So in our paper... Two minutes left. Yes? Two minutes. So in, yeah, no problem, fine. So in our paper, we do some kind of phenomenology related to this. So you can go to the paper because I don't have enough time. But we took this uh, statically symmetric perturbed solutions, and we analyzed different phenomenology. One thing that we analyzed is what the photon sphere and the shadow. So I don't have all the time because in 10 minutes it's difficult to explain all of this, but Depending on the model, we have different a large or smaller shadow of the black hole for, uh, for the situation. And also we computed the Pelagian ship. So we have the standard uh, form that we have from GR plus the correction. And uh, then we have uh, different Pelagian ships, let's say, depending on the value of this parameter, we have, we have bigger or smaller values of uh, the Pelagian ship. And also we use some, uh, some data from solar system tests. So also we did the same for deflection of light. It is a kind of complicated computation where you have some integrals, some expansions. It's not so easy to explain, but you can go into the paper to see this. But we got this typical term in GR, this Schwarzschild term, plus the corrections related to the, to the solution that we got, which is Schwarzschild plus a, a correction. And of course, you have, have different kind of deflection lights depending on the values of the parameters. Also, we computed Shapiro delays, which is also not so trivial. And we got the typical GR uh, result plus the, the corrections. And finally, we constrain our models, let's say in the solar system with some uh, uh, constraint. So we have, for example, for Mercury, as an example, you know the value from GR. If you take the values from GR from Mercury, you have this very well known result. So we know the observed result. So we know the maximum value that we can take from uh, our uh, modification of our, uh, our perturbed solution. And using this, one can find a constraint on the model and the maximum value that you can take from your uh, model alpha and beta, for example, and also gamma. Uh, we did this the same thing for all the solar system tests, uh, the, the tests that I showed you before, the relation shift and direction of light, uh, and also uh, shadow. And we try to constrain all this model with the maximum value that you can have for these perturbed solutions. Now, these perturbed solutions are interesting because you can do also many other phenomenology. So to conclude, because I don't have enough time, uh, the most important result or message to your home is that there's this framework, which is called the Pelagian framework, when you have tension instead of curvature, there's a specific theory, which is the TEGR, which is exactly equivalent to GR. Exactly equivalent to GR, you have the same prediction, everything is the same. And then when you start modifying with this theory, you will get different theories at modification or GR. And then you can try to analyze cosmology, spherical symmetries, and know solutions. And we found we were able to find to found solutions, which are perturbed solutions around Schwarzschild. And this is a theory, which is the F of TV gravity theory, which is a theory which is related also to F of R. So is, F of R is contained in this theory. Okay? So we compute the different solar system tests, at this as the one that I'm showing there. And then we constrain this model using solar system um, observations. And we found that the contribution that I, I am showing there are much smaller than the contribution from uh, just having B squared. And when you have, for example, terms like the power of three, you have a much, much, much smaller contribution than contribution coming from squares, let's say. That is one of the conclusions that I can say. So yeah, I think that's everything from my side. So thank you a lot for listening to me. Uh, yeah, it's just a minute. So I, I can give all the details. You can go to the paper that you will be probably soon in JCAP to, to know all the details. So thank you again. Okay, we thank the speaker. We have a rapid question by Kirill Marcel. Please, Kirill. So, did I understand correctly that in the uh, FT theory that you presented, or FTB, there is no exact spherical symmetric solution that would be analogous to the Schwarzschild solution in GR? And so the method you proposed is that you start off with the Schwarzschild metric background, and then you introduce perturbations on, onto it, in the teleparallel gravity framework. Yes, right. because the, the problem that is that you have the field separation and even write down the field question because they are horrible. The problem is that uh, so far we haven't been able to solve the F of T or F of TV gravity spherical symmetric equation in an exact form. But I think this also is a problem in F of R. 
In every file also, you don't get a exactly charge child, actually, as an exact solution. Only you can get it when you have R equal constant. But R equals constant is a very specific case, which is just GR plus a cosmetical constant. In, the, in this case, it's the same. If you start with F of T or F of T V gravity, if you, find, if you put that T is equal to a constant, of course, you will get charge because you have charge the sitter or GR plus a cosmetical constant. But uh, so far, there have been a lot of, of trials trying to find exact solutions. But we don't have find any solution. We only know that T GR, so you, when you put F equal to T, then you recover GR and you have charge But then if you have any modifications like, like T plus T squared or T plus T, T to the power of three, it's difficult to solve the field equation. That's why we know that in T GR we have charge of course, because it's GR, but the modification of GR, as happens in FFR, FFR is difficult to find solutions. We haven't found solutions which are like charge plus something, but we can we can use these perturbation techniques to find solutions like that. So that's why we did here. We start with the charge chain. We, we have the teleparallel equation. We have GR in the background. Let's say just T plus a correction. And these corrections is just a first order correction of your uh, first equation. And that that's why we could able to find this uh, perturb solution. Thank you. So let's thank the speaker again, and we go on with the program. So the next speaker is going to be Paulino Javier Dominguez Chavez, and he's going to talk about vanishing superpointing observers of a pencil of light in the Melvin universe. Thank you. Thank you very much for the time for giving this short talk. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about uh, gravitational field super energy flux and uh, an application of this concept in um, an SX solution of Einstein field equations, uh, namely a pencil of light in the Melvin universe. And um, uh, there are two special cases, the non-spinning magnetized pencil of light and the spinning magnetized pencil of light and then we'll give a, a few concluding remarks. So, um, but there's a, uh, the motivation for this uh, research is that Mickiewicz uh, found uh, that a monochromatic plane electromagnetic wave can travel at a subluminal speed when, they, when uh, these waves propagate under the background of a magnetic field. So um, then we, try to, to find this um, same effect, but in general relativity. So uh, the, the question here is playing gravitational waves propagate at what speed over a strong magnetic field background. So uh, there is a, a research uh, that uh, playing gravitational waves propagate at a subluminal speed when they collide and but uh, there's no uh, research about uh, gravitational plane was propagating alone in vacuum. So um, this is the reason for um, we're taking into account the gravitational field superenergy flux. And let's talk a, a little bit about the superenergy tensor, the Bell Robinson tensor. Um, this tensor is constructed in analogy to the to the well-known energy momentum tensor in electromagnetism, but with the help of the uh, bile tensor C. So this is a four-rank tensor, and it has a, it has a, these prop mathematical properties. Next, um, we can construct a super pointing vector in analogy with the pointing vector of electromagnetism uh, by uh, ma uh, making this three temporal uh, projections on one special projection. And uh, this uh, super energy vector can be also written in terms of the well-known uh, quasi-electric and quasi-magnetic parts of the Weyl tensor, X and Y, that we have here that can be calculated using the components of the Weyl tensor and the corresponding uh, dual conjugate, okay? So um, the pencil of light solution, what is a pencil of light? Well, uh, there, there have been uh, previous works uh, with Perrier and Bonor about the gravitational field of light 
and uh, they come to the conclusion that uh, these plane waves, uh, the source of these plane gravitational waves can be a pencil of light. It means namely a linear source uh, that propagates at the speed of light and is infinitely extended in one direction. Okay, this is the definition of a pencil of light. And after that, Katalo Komarajan Miskiewicz uh, performed the magnetization of this solution, the pencil of light, and came to this metric six. Here uh, we have uh, common cylindrical coordinates, and uh, we have these uh, functions that represents the intensity of the beam and the rotation, G. G is the rotation, and K is related to the intensity of the pencil of light. Okay, so uh, we're working with the tracks instead of the metric for using Cartan theory, and we introduce a monad field. It does the four velocity of any observer, and we can um, here in the, the expression in hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine uh, of some arbitrary function psi that we can that we must uh, encounter in order to uh, represent the full solution. And for, for this example, we can calculate the components of the electric pile tensor X and Y, the magnetic part. And um, using this um, same analogy with electromagnetism, the super pointing vector can be rewritten in terms of these components and the 4M10, okay? And uh, we can see here that for the vanishing of this super pointing vector, we require that uh, this um, x22 minus x33 becomes zero, okay? So uh, we have here a condition for the vanishing, the super pointing vector, and we can uh, obtain the expression 11 after this uh, consideration. And here uh, we have functions of B and rho. B is the advanced time. And uh, M is just, just a function. But uh, we can plot this uh, four velocity fields of the observers. They're considered just moving with the gravitational oh, field. Yeah, sorry. Of this yeah. And And um, okay, we have here the singularity that appears. This metric has a, a coordinate singularity. Okay, we can observe here that uh, there are subluminal speeds of this gravitational field. It's not, there's no uh, only um, luminal speed. So next, um, we have the same results for different kinds of intensity functions, K. For example, this is for K equals one divided by B squared. And here we have sine of B. We have different behavior. And uh, for an exponential, we have here a, um, a pulse, a light pulse, producing this gravitational field. So, um, okay, then next we have, uh, we need to move to the spinning magnetized pencil of light case. In this spinning, there's um, a difference where we have a, a physical similarity here in the metric. And this is going to affect the, the results. Okay, so we uh, we do the same the same procedure to calculate the components of the electric and magnetic pile tensors and find the vanishing of the superpointing vector. Here the condition we have the condition, and we obtain the velocity field of the observers. So if we plot this function, we obtain this for the intensity k one divided by B squared. Note here that we have a light blue region near the physical singularity, meaning that this, uh, the gravitational field is, is lowering down to zero here near this, uh, this region. So the next plot, we have uh, this result for a, um, for a light pulse. And finally, for an, periodic function sinus, we have this. All these uh, plots have the same or the similar results, having a reduction to zero near the 
this is called singularity. Okay, uh, so concluding remarks. We have shown that it is possible to find moving observers with the magnetized pencil of light. Okay, so the pencil of light alone propagates the speed of light, but if we uh, uh, magnetize this pencil of light, we can have subluminal propagation. And um, another thing is that the magnetic field intensity affects the velocity. If we uh, increase the magnetic field intensity, we have a deviation of the uh, velocity field. And it is important uh, that this, the reduction to zero is near the physical singularity only. This is not uh, happening with the coordinate singularity uh, case, okay? So um, thank you very much for your attention. If you have a question, please. Okay, we thank the speaker. So if there is if there's time for a rapid question, so if someone has something to ask, please. Okay, no questions. So we thank the speaker again, and we go on with the schedule. So the next talk is gonna be by Eduard Larranaga. And the title of the talk is a toy model to calculate the gravitational radiation produced by a particle plunging into a static, spherically symmetric black hole in massive gravity. Thank you. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I cannot share the screen. Uh, it says that I have to ask. Yes, Gregory, very shaggy. Yes, you probably need to reboot your system or uh, start again your application. Okay. Okay, and now you can share yes. the screen. Uh, okay, can you see the, the screen now? Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, hello everyone. Uh, to begin, I want to talk, uh, thank the organizers of this meeting for having me and let me share this work. Uh, today, I will talk about a tool model to study the gravitational radiation waveforms produced by a point particle uh, plunging into a black hole in the massive gravity scenario. Uh, Theories of massive gravity have been proposed as modification of general relativity since the first half of the 20th century. And in recent years, this idea has been reconsidered involving now ultralight massive gravitons. Some of this new interest in massive gravity arises because it could explain some observational phenomena as the accelerated expansion of the universe without requiring dark energy or a cosmological constant. Works such as this one by Godhaver and Nieto, and this one by Perkins and Jones in 2019 studied experimental constraints of the mass of the graviton. The estimates give a value between 10 to the minus 20 and 10 to the minus 34 electron volts. On the other hand, due to the recent advances in gravitational wave observation, it is possible that the next generation of detectors may test massive gravity theories. Works such as the paper by Brito, Cardoso, and Pani studied the gravitational perturbations of a uh, Schwarzschild's black hole in the context of bimetric theory of gravity. With this idea of testing massive gravity in the context of black holes and gravitational radiation, we want to generalize the work of the Canini, Folashi, and old LAD of 2015 to describe the gravitational radiation produced by a point particle plunging from slightly below the innermost stable circular orbit into a general static spherical symmetric black hole from the massive gravity theory. Since a general treatment is extremely complicated and to prevent some of the difficulties shown in the work of Brito, we will make some assumptions to simplify the problem. First, we will consider that the black hole is much heavier than the particle uh, 
Uh, so the description will be done using the framework of black hole perturbations. The second and most important assumption will be that the massive spin to perturbation of massive gravity will be replaced by a toy model in which, uh, uh, in which the point particle is linearly coupled to a massive scalar field. In this simplified model, uh, we will consider that the point particle has a proper mass M0, a scalar charge Q, and that it moves along a curved gamma in a background in space, which will have this structure, representing the spherical symmetry. We will assume that there exists an event horizon defined by the zero of the function F in order to write the corresponding equations. We introduce the tortoise coordinate R star. The mathematical description is obtained by introducing the action of the system, which is decomposed into an action describing the particle, another term describing the massive scalar field, and an interaction term in which the coupling of the particle and the field is given by the scalar charge density rho. We begin by obtaining the field equation for phi. Due to the staticity and the spherical symmetry of the space-time, we can introduce the decomposition in spherical harmonics for both the field and the density. Replacing this expression into the field equation, we obtain the well-known Reggie Wheeler equation with sources in which we identify the potential B in terms of the function F and the function H. Uh, the solution of this equation is formally obtained by using the green function method. Denoting G, the green function, the general solution of the equation with source is given by its integral with the density coefficients, which can be written in terms of the turtle coordinate or in terms of the original radial coordinate. The green function can be written following the work of Breuer et al. as the product of two linearly independent functions, U in, which is a solution defined by its ingoing behavior at the event horizon, and U out, which is defined by its outgoing behavior at the spatial infinity. Now, uh, we'll, uh, we will consider the motion of the point particle, uh, which defines the source. The equation of motion are easily obtained from the action presented before. Due to the spherical symmetry of the space-time, the trajectory is restricted to a plane, which we will choose as the equatorial one. The conservative quantities are identified as the energy per unit mass and the angular per, uh, per unit mass. Using this constant of motion, the radial equation of motion is given by this expression, and using these results, we obtain the following charge density. Now we are ready to consider some particular trajectories to calculate the corresponding gravitational radiation waveforms. The first example corresponds to a point particle in circular motion around the central object. Obviously, this trajectory has a constant radius, and therefore the radial velocity and radial acceleration are zero. Hence, it is straightforward to uh, identify the angular velocity both as d phi dt as well as d, d phi d tau. After changing the variable tau by phi and integrating, we obtain the general form uh, for the density coefficients and with this expression, the coefficients in the field decomposition. Since the Schwarzschild matrix is also a solution in the theory of massive gravity, it is natural to consider this case as a fair example of a background in space-time, and the results can be directly compared with previous studies. In particular, the toy model will permit us to obtain the analytic expression for the waveform contribution and to avoid some problems in the calculations, such as the unstable behavior of the background matrix or the dynamic dipole modes reported by Brito. An interesting circular orbit corresponds to the innermost stable circular orbit, or uh, ISCO, which for social metric is located at r equals 6m. The angular velocity for a particle moving in this trajectory is given by this expression. Two minutes left. Restricted. Two minutes. Uh, restricted analysis to the mode. Okay. Restricted our analysis to the mode with L equal to and M equal to, the amplitude of the waveform is explicitly obtained and presents an interesting dependence of the mass of the scalar field and on the location of the observer. As in this plot, for an observer located at a large distance from the source, there is a critical value of the mass uh, denoted by mu sub c, for which the amplitude vanishes. The results indicate that the observers located at distances greater than 50 m won't receive excitation for the system produced by particles orbiting at the ISCO radius. 
when the scale of field has a mass greater than uh, this value of uh, 0.2722 in a dimensional units. Observers located at closer distances will perceive a smooth behavior, but the amplitude is also decreasing function of the field mass. A similar behavior is obtained for the modes as can be seen from these curves. Note that the critical mass for the scalar field increases for high over their modes. But in all cases, the transition between dispersive propagation and evanescent behavior is present. The second example is uh, a particle plunging into the black fork from slightly below the ISCO. The coefficients in the expansion and the density are calculated. However, in this case, it is not possible to obtain a closed form for the coefficient of the field expansion. Instead, uh, we can uh, integrate numerically the rigid Wheeler equations. Once more, the partial waveforms will depend on both the mass and the scalar field and on the position of the observer. Well, in both cases, it's possible to decompose the waveform into three phases. First, the debatic phase, uh, in which the motion is quasi-circular near the ice cone. The second part corresponds to a ring-down phase, and the third part comes after the particle crosses the event horizon. Well, uh, the results reproduce the behavior reported by the Canini, Folashi, and Old LAD, but our treatment can be generalized to approximate other static and spherical symmetric metrics for mass and gravity. This toy model shows a behavior that one can expect from gravitational radiation in the context of mass gravity, such as the evanescent nature of the partial modes. Additionally, this scalar radiation showed the three phases in the waveform, and in particular, the adiabatic phase showed that for an observer at a large distance from the black hole, there exists a critical value for the mass of the scalar field, which separates the dispersive behavior and the evanescent regime of the waveform. This implies that the scalar fields with mass above the critical value produce waveforms that cannot be observed at special infinity. Well, thank you very much. We thank the speaker. We have a question by Daniel Blixt, please, rapidly. Yeah, so we know that uh, massive gravity have its uh, Weinstein screening effect. Does this toy model take this into account in some sense and how? Well, this is a first, uh, we consider that this is our first approximation of the uh, massive gravity scenario. Uh, we use this toy model to study uh, at first approximation the waveform, but uh, spin to uh, consideration of the field must be present in the complete scenario. Uh, then uh, we expect that this evanescent behavior will be present also in the complete uh, study. Okay, so we thank the speaker again, uh, and we go to the last talk uh, by Alexei Shablov. He's going to talk about the stability of a static spherically symmetric wormhole in the framework of the five-dimensional projective unified field theory. Thank you. Wormholes are one of the uh, most. Uh, Alexey, excuse me. Can you share your screen, please? Uh, prediction. Can you share your screen, uh, please? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can uh, you share your right. screen? Okay, thank you. So, wormholes uh, uh, are the. Oh, the one of the most amazing uh, prediction of uh, general relativity. Warholmes was first predicted in 1916 by Flam. Uh, the first mathematical model of wormhole was created by Anne Rosen in uh, Southern Bridge. Unfortunately, uh, the bridge turned up not traversable. Subsequent uh, investigation shown, shows that table traversable uh, wormholes require matter of field with some exotic properties. Uh, it is interesting that hypothetical dark energy 
can be described as color field with such properties. Uh, so uh, uh, there is uh, interesting uh, in uh, uh, theories uh, which have uh, uh, such fields uh, as uh, inter interesting uh, attribute of the theories. And uh, the five dimensional projective unified field theory is uh, the one of the such fields. Uh, the main idea of projective theory uh, is as follows. Uh, the Einstein-like equation are introducing in five-dimensional space. Uh, then uh, uh, they project uh, onto four-dimensional space time by special product rule. Uh, As a result, we uh, have four-dimensional equation for gravitational, electromagnetic, and scalar field. Uh, the gravitation of, uh, of uh, uh, projective theory uh, are similar to the one of uh, general relativity with phantom uh, scalar field. Uh, but in order to the general relativity, uh, Electromagnet is uh, one of the sources of color field, and the color field includes uh, on electromagnetic field. Sorry. Tark. Uh -huh. symmetric uh, solution uh, one. A spherical symmetric solution, one of the uh, exact solution of uh, the projective uh, theory. Spherical symmetric metric have the following uh, general form and lead to the uh, uh, this uh, uh, system of equation. In uh, uh, Static case, we obtain the following solution, and uh, the first and second, the first and second cases uh, describe uh, uh, objects with throws and uh, um, new singularities, except the one special uh, case with. Q sub sigma and Q is equal to zero. This uh, case lead to Schwarzschild solution. And the third case uh, describes form homes with uh, mass, uh, electrical charge, and charge of scalaric field. All cases have the same behavior at positive infinity and uh, we can interpret the constant we receive in solution as uh, mass, uh, electrical charge, and charge of caloric field. The problem of uh, stability is very important for wormholes. And uh, this problem can be uh, fundamentally split uh, into two uh, parts, uh, polar perturbation and electrical perturbation. And uh, polar attribution is the most important one. Uh, the perturbated metric with uh, polar perturbation has the following form, and uh, in a uh, linear approximation, lead to uh, this five equation with one additional equation, uh, uh, which play a role of uh, gauge uh, condition, and this five equation. Uh, can be uh, combined uh, in uh, one uh, in a single linear second order differential equation of the auxiliary perturbation function. Uh, by variation of constant m and q, 
uh, in the uh, in the static uh, exact solution uh, give us a particular solution of the master equation and the variation of constant q sub sigma give uh, the static particle solution of complementary equation. Uh, further, we look for solution of complementary equation uh, in, for, in form. Uh, this form uh, lead to uh, single uh, transformation. And uh, uh, after describing, uh, we receive this uh, form of the solution. We transform into the right form. With, all right. Uh, with potential uh, V and pay special attention on uh, case uh, omega uh, real omega which is uh, e less than zero the potential v always has a singularity in rows is equal to zero but uh, consults and uh, other uh, show the mathematical question by using the uh, partition. Uh, we uh, can localize uh, uh, value of omega where uh, the uh, solution uh, have uh, it asymptotic on both infinities uh, for our case uh, of charged uh, we have some problem uh, with additional but uh, the problem one and can be uh, easy solved uh, by the simple algorithm so uh, we uh, tested all parameters and uh, find out found out that for all parameter uh, uh, exist uh, one uh, uh, critical value of omega in which uh, uh, there is one mode with finite and finite uh, asymptotic for all finite asymptotic this mode leads to exponential growing of in time of perturbation function and uh, uh, this mode lead to instability of all class of statical spherical symmetrical form holes in framework of uh, projective theory thanks for your attention we thank the speaker if there is a question we have a few minutes please So no questions, so we thank the speaker again. Uh, we have concluded this afternoon session and I would like to thank uh, both the speakers and the participants. Good afternoon.